Welcome to Squirrel, the podcast for distracted writers, hosted by Candace J. Thomas and Jody L. Milner. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Squirrel. This is Jody. This is Candace. And today we are finishing out spooky season with a world building episode. We are talking all about creating spooky story settings. And my goal is to creep the pants off of Candy. That's, yep. I am already just doing research for this was making me, yeah, revisit some of my dark corners and the things that I shut away in my brain so I don't have to remember them. Oh, good. A therapy. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is going to be a therapy episode. I don't know if it's therapy. Again. I think it's reopening some of it's these wounds. It's an exposure but... therapy. <laughs> I don't even know. Okay. So when we think of spooky settings, uh, we think dark crypts and cramped tunnels filled with spiders or a doll museum, uh, haunted abandoned houses. Like a spooky setting can be anything if you want it to be. But if you play your cards right... Uh, you can really dig into these internal fears that people have and use setting to just set it off. Today, we're going to discuss how to craft a st truly spooky setting and all the sneaky little tricks writers use to make things seem scarier than they are. Yes. And so our very first one thing I want to kick off with is just what's the scariest setting you've experienced in either a film or a book? And this could be generalized or this could be a specific example. Um. All right. Well... That mine sounds so dumb compared to yours. Mine's really, really creepy. Yeah. Um, why don't you do your creepy one first? Okay. We'll kick, kick this off. Okay. So there, there's a specific setting that gives me the ick more than every, anything else, and that's creepy amusement park or oh. creepy circus. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Anything that's supposed to be these light, jovial places for children that they subvert into these really cre creepy horror shows, it just ugh, it gives me... It gives me the ick. And so, like, we see this in Something Wicked This Way Comes. There was an old cable movie that was Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I watched it when I was, like, 14. Oh my goodness. I still can't get some of that out of my head. <laughs> it's, like... Like the, the the corn, the popcorn was like little monster seeds and it would pop out of the bucket and then it would like dig around and then it would turn into this thing that would try to chase you. And then like, I think Zombieland had some creepy amusement park scenes mm -hmm. in it too. Uh, Final Destination 3 has some in there. Like there's something about a place that's supposed to be so fun and lighthearted, like twisting that around just, mm -hmm. how about you? When I'm thinking about a setting that I think is about the scariest and the one that I'm still that I still gets me, bear with me, everyone. It's the Disney's Sleepy Hollow with uh, the cartoon one, where Ichabod Crane is traveling through the forest after the whole merriment of everything, and they're I don't know a, a hip a clippity clop and a. <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen that. <laughs> He's going to find a head to chop i mean it's awesome so fun but when he is when i'm thinking of setting when ichabod crane is traveling through the like the woods there's a lot of misdirection with sound and there's like clomping that you hear and you think that it might be the headless horseman but it's just these reeds going on or you hear like the raven caw beware beware or the the croaking sound of a frog where he's like, Ichabod, Ichabod. Oh my gosh. It was so terrifying, that whole setting until, and, and then when you get to the headless horseman, like you think that you're safe because they just realized, oh, it was just butterflies. Oh, how funny. And then you hear the laugh come from the headless horseman and it is terrifying. It's just terrifying. <laughs> so... I, you can tell I am still You've been scarred for life. I, I love, I watch this every year because I love it so much. But when I think of setting specifically, that one has a lot of points that it hits and it still creeps me out even in my forties. <laughs> so. All right. A different Disney that I just thought of. I'm just curious if you've, if you've seen Watcher in the Woods. Of course we've seen Watcher in the Woods. Because Narek. Yeah. Um, yep. I, well, we should, we should, I should revisit that one. That one scared me too. There's a whole bunch of parts like, in I it where it's misdirection. I got so afraid of, yeah. of looking in the mirror because 
because that girl was always yelling, help me in the mirror. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Creepy, creepy. Ooh, we're going to use little tidbits of <laughs> these settings from popular things to teach about how to do an effective setting. So the first, the first piece we're going to teach is how important it is when describing settings, especially spooky settings, that less is more in these situations. It's more important to evoke a sense of atmosphere than to be really accurate in your descriptions. And this really brings you into sensory details. That's why they're just so important. And I'm thinking about my Ichabod crane. It, it follows exactly what these sensory details are. So when you are creating a, like a spooky atmosphere, it's it's the best way for the reader to experience what is happening to the characters, right? It's the same with like visually seeing something on the screen. The cinematography is really important in storytelling, even in paper. So you are creating the atmosphere for fear to play with your imagination. And then I think the second half of this equation is showing things that people can't quite figure out what they're seeing. Like if we're looking, uh, uh, watching a screen or if we're reading, introduce details where the reader can't get a grasp on what's happening. They just get the sense that something ominous might be there and that our character is reacting. And so the other part is creating the, these unknowns or these unpredictables because like for poor Ichabod mm -hmm. he would hear the clomping hoofs even though it was the reeds but he didn't know that at first and right. so you'd see him panic yeah and then he'd be like oh, oh and okay, as okay. the person watching you also feel the panic yeah and that's what I love about good storytelling when and you would hear that. he would hear things call his name but it was like the birds in the forest or he mm. would he would hear uh, the screams and whinnies of the horse. Like there are all these little things that he would pick up and all of those were sensory things, uh, things he heard, uh, the wind that was brushing up, like mm -hmm. the, the wind like kept on the wind, playing yeah. with him. Mm -hmm. And all of those things evoked this sense of what is going on. Mm -hmm. And he was already spooked because he knew the legend. Yeah. And yeah. so um, there's also places like, if you're going to set one of these places in like the deep space or the deep ocean, and you hear a weird noise and you have no idea what it is, yeah. that's fundamentally freaky. Yeah. Especially if you're in a place where you're like, if something goes wrong, I die. Mm -hmm. Like deep space, you know, if the airlock blows, you die. Deep ocean, the same thing. If the airlock blows, you die. Yeah. You remind me of uh, when I first saw Aliens. Oh, yeah. A lot of, a lot of the detail sent like you don't know exactly what the alien sounds like and you only see like hints and traces of it mm -hmm. for forever in the movie like you don't see the actual alien until like the last 15 minutes oh my gosh and it's freaky i'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight <laughs> just saying it's okay <laughs> we can have cookies later <laughs> okay so i'm alone tonight this is <laughs> anyway go on <laughs> Okay, so our next tip is that you want to keep your reader as disoriented as the characters are and create a setting that is unstable and take away your reader's sense of security. So there's a couple ways you can make settings unpredictable. And a lot of this is digging into the unknown natures of where you're setting the story. What's in the basement? What is outside the back door? What dangers might be there? Like if you're on an alien spaceship, you might not understand the alien language. You don't know what door is going to be the bathroom and what door is going to be the airlock or the big nasty beast. Yeah. Like there's a lot of unknowns in that. I don't know if any of you are video gamers, but there was a, a game called Hello Neighbor that it was this really creepy neighbor that had a house that was like all rickety and like super tall and it just had stories upon stories and you just never knew what was going to be behind be behind each door and there were these mannequins that would jump out at you Ooh, uh. <laughs> i just gave candy the <laughs> ick achievement unlocked <laughs> anyway, totally <laughs> your readers have zero confidence of what's going to happen if they turn around if they open a door if they take any if they turn on a light they should have zero confidence of what they're going to see Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it creepy. Oh my God. Do you have good examples of this? Um, yeah. Well, the best example that I could think of was the unknown from Over the Garden Wall. 
Did you watch that yet? You told me to. I told you to do that instead. last year. But I watched What We Do in the Shadows instead. Oh, that's so pretty good. I, I'm catching up. Okay. No, Over the Garden Wall is totally worth watching. Watch it with your kids. And it's only 10 minute episodes. You can make it through the whole series very fast. So the place where they wander is called the unknown. And each episode has a different episodic setting. So you don't know exactly what you're running into. It might be there's one where an episode where there's a like a pumpkin dance, all these all these people have pumpkins on their head, but you don't know. And they're doing a pumpkin dance around, but then they give like Wirt and Greg, a, you know, they have to dig a hole and the hole happens to be like where they're going to be buried type thing. But that is a different setting. And, and then, or there's one where, you know, you see the beast or the one with like anti whispers. Oh my gosh. One with anti whispers is so creepy, and Tim Curry does the voice for oh. anti whispers. So, yeah. Lovely. Oh my gosh. So anyway, I also thought of like the upside down is something that where you have no idea what the security level is there because it's it's, it's like a different dimension. Mm-hmm. You have no concept of what you're about to see, and I liked that like the concept of of not being able to see stuff. So. I also think that uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll we'll keep we're, on moving we're getting on. into it. <laughs> okay. Don't get too excited. I know we've got lots of tips here. So okay, so um, the next tip is to consider how the weather plays into the story. Can you hear thunder in the distance or wind howling? Um, and how do those sounds increase the tension for your character? Mm-hmm. Weather is something that we first of all can't control. So it's it's using elements from storms to display like um, a specific moment that the character doesn't have control of. You could say that. And it can be that in using it that in that way, it can be effective uh, storytelling tool. It's also very poignant, like specific elements can can heighten a moment of like terror or whatever. You see a lightning crash and you see a image in the distance, that kind of thing. And then it goes back dark, something like that. Um, I'm so glad so you, you know that something up. I was is just coming. thinking that. But but yeah, you can't. You don't. You don't know. But what's coming. well, and then you have the thunder that comes, and it deafens you for just that moment where anything could be happening, and you really you couldn't hear it, mm-hmm. which is yeah. freaky. Yeah, weather is just a really good companion to whatever setting that you're putting your story in. Well, if we go in down to the psychology, sound is one of those senses that are super important to warn us of danger. Like even from the caveman days, uh, the first was smell. Like if you smell burning or the smell of a dangerous animal, like your fight or flight reaction kicks in and it bypasses your logic centers. And that's why smell can bring up memory so quickly. Oh, and yeah. right after that is sound. Uh, you're you're somewhere and they're playing old timey music and you hear something that you once heard when you were driving with your grandma in her car. Yes, and you all of a sudden get this memory yeah. of oh my goodness. Or or even like I, I will often have moments where I remember where I was with this song and what dance I was with and what I was wearing and mm-hmm. all, the, all the things, all the memories flood back. Like there was a summer where uh, there was a room in the basement that my parents wanted repainted, but I wanted to do so like a really special painting treatment. So it took forever. And I had the same radio station on and it was like B98.7 and they had like their 15 songs of the summer that they just played over and over and over. I still smell paint <laughs> when I hear those songs. <laughs> it is bizarre. I probably got a little high that year. That is awesome. All right. So is that... That's that I was going to move right? into our next tip about history. Okay. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, go for okay. it. So drip feed the history of a place to the reader through small clues, um, old journal entries or local legends, and let them piece together the horror. So tell me about that. So this, I feel like this follows up on our mystery episode because people like readers like to feel like they're one step ahead of the main character. Mm-hmm. And they're they're just a little smarter 
than the main character. And so if you're, if we're piecing out these tiny important clues and they're like, oh my gosh, it's the gardener. Like if they figure it out before the reader, but not so far ahead, that's like, duh. Like it really, really amps it up because now our reader's like, don't go in there. That's the bad place yes. because they know. And then all of a sudden you're just cheering for the character to do one thing or another thing. <laughs> right? Or, or you're like pleading with them to not go down the basement stairs alone. On that same note. Yeah. I, I like that it creates brain work for the readers. And just like you were mentioning, and it makes the reader a character really. Uh, this is how like really good, mystery stories are displayed and why I think so many mystery readers stay with that genre because because they feel like a character in the book. Well, it's very immersive. It's more immersive than I think any other genre because you feel like you're part of the story. Mm -hmm. You're trying to solve it too. I recently read Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman, which I mentioned briefly in our last episode. But I want to mention this because in the whole thing is just told by a whole bunch of different people telling pretty much the same story and what's how they're viewing it. You don't get any specific details. You have to piece the whole thing together by these different people's view of it. So that was a lot of really like slowly discovering the information. That was completely drip fed the the history of everything just like you you mentioned. So which was really fun to just get a piece here and a piece there and go, oh my gosh, there's something really crazy. And you become super invested. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Our next tip is how important it is to dig into the themes of isolation and entrapment. Show how the characters gradually realize that they are stuck either geographically or psychologically and how that plays into the decisions they make. And so there's two different elements of this. There is the um, psychological isolation, and then there's a physical isolation that comes into play. Do you want to touch on yours first? Sure. I mean, I I went with both psychological and physical because I couldn't I couldn't differentiate that from from the stories that I know that they play off of each other. So the first story that I thought, well, I'll just say that Stephen King does this a lot. Mm -hmm. in his in his stories because he likes to play on the psychological feeling of isolation like you were just mentioning so I thought of like misery that one I mean he is completely dependent they're they're in the middle of like nowhere no one knows where he this this guy is and he's completely dependent on what this lady is doing that that is one of those I feel that's psychological fear and because there, there's real fear there too. But The Shining is, I think, a, a more perfect example of setting with isolation being like an important plot point. I was never brave enough to read the story. I'll tell you that. But I have seen The Shining several times, the movie. And that one, it, it makes you a little crazy watching it. You feel the crazy when this guy is like they're completely snowed in in this hotel and this guy's just losing it so it really plays on those fears yeah how and the unknown like you're not gonna if he's going crazy you don't know what's gonna happen next no it's completely unpredictable so being somewhere where there's like no chance of rescue like yeah you're on your own and you don't know what's gonna happen like i think everyone can identify with this feeling of oh crap my car's broken down I'm in the middle of the desert I'm hearing coyotes what's gonna happen there's a mysterious figure that's walking down this this lonely road they're probably a murderer like everyone has had these runaway thoughts of the worst possible thing happening and it's always when we're alone either actually alone or if if you're in like a really big group of people but you don't really know anyone true then you're like i don't know what's going to happen like i don't know what to expect with these these people i've never been with them and if you put somebody in a i know i felt this when i was in portugal when you are around 
other people that speak a different language and you are not part of that conversation is extremely isolating. So I can see where that also could create part of your setting if you even if you're doing like a science fiction or a fantasy in your the one that doesn't speak the language where everyone else does that can really put you in that mental state. Well, and if you're already kind of freaked out because maybe you heard a legend that on a certain night that they pick someone to, you know, sacrifice to their God. Sure. And they're looking at you and you don't know what they're saying. <laughs> right? Yeah. It builds itself. Yeah. The story builds itself. <laughs> All right. Number six, playing with the psychology of darkness. And this scares me so bad. Um, what isn't what isn't seen can be scary than what is. So you just let the imagination the the reader's imagination fill the gaps. Okay, I had this explained to me in a way that really resonated. So imagine that someone has a paper cup that is upside down on a table and tells you there's a spider under that cup. Do you know how big the spider is? Do you care? What is your imagination doing? <laughs> and then, enormous. you know, they knock it over and your first reaction is run. Mm -hmm. It might be the tiniest little spider, but your brain doesn't know that. And so all of a sudden you're really, really terrified of what's under the cup. What's worse is they're like, there's something scary under this cup and they don't tell you what it is. Right. How much worse is it when you don't know what it is and it's under the cup and it's right in front of you? I don't think there could be anything worse in under a cup than a spider. I don't Let's know, scorpion. I don't scorpions don't Didn't scare you tie me. A snake. No, but spiders. Nah. Something with really nice. long, squiggly legs. <laughs> That's a really you make a really good point that our brain fills in those yeah psychological details. We want to fill it in. It's like we're. It's the same way that it's, we're programmed to see faces where there aren't faces, it goes back to those primitive times where being able to identify a danger and get away from it or face it saved our lives. And so we'll see faces in everything, even if they're not there. We will see monsters in everything, even if they're not there. But as soon as you like focus in on that dark patch and you can see it's a dude in a rubber suit, <laughs> the mystery's gone. It's not scary anymore. I think that's what I felt about it. It yeah, the, the the clown idea of a of a clown killing children is really terrifying. Mm -hmm. But when it goes it's back to just the cursed carnival, yeah, exactly. Thing. So, but, but but yeah, when you reveal that what kind of monster it is at the end, it wasn't as scary. I don't like it when they explain. I mean, sure, it's some kind of eldritch horror. Great. Don't explain it to me. That It's like when you explain midichlorians. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, we talk, I don't we care. Told you about this. Don't do Just that. Just defeat it. Yeah. The dark is one of those things that I still have a fear of. Like, I had a, a bad Bloody Mary experience. Please say it was in the bathroom of your school cafeteria. <laughs> Ew. Maybe. Because <laughs> that's where we did ours. <laughs> yeah, it was it wasn't in the cafeteria, but it was definitely in my old it was a very old elementary school and yes. Was that the one bathroom that had no windows? Yes, there were no windows. You're right. Okay. <laughs> There's always one in every school. Why did and, they do that? And yeah, we totally saw Bloody Mary there, guys. It was terrifying. <laughs> yeah, we would do that and I don't know why they planned the school the way they did, but you could turn the lights off in that bathroom. Yeah. Like they don't have the switches that they have today. Yeah. Where you it have was the key. Great. So I was so terrified of the dark because of that. I I had to have a nightlight. I if I had a mirror in my room, I would cover it. <laughs> Fair oh game. Gosh. I'm such a I don't know. Oh my gosh, I'm so Okay. I, I swear, like Every single scary movie is going to have, or scary book is going to have a place where the main character can't see or can't tell what's going on. And they just have to figure it out by what they're hearing. And so, like, even if it's like somebody walking across the carpet, but it sounds like something being chewed on something. Like, your imagination does crazy your, things. Yeah, your brain just wants to think the worst. And so. then when you, like, have the lights turn on, they have, like, oh, phew. 
it was just this stupid thing. It was like the bubbler on my fish tank. It was a stupid, stupid thing. And then the jump scare gets you. <laughs> right after that. Yep. Every time. That's true. <laughs> yep. That's and turn so around true. and it's Jason. Oh my gosh. You feel secure, but you're actually not. Well, and that's what they want. It's this roller coaster of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm freaked out. Oh, I'm fine. Now I'm dead. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Very good. Okay, spooky settings on our own projects. This is where we get to have a little bit of fun. Yay. <laughs> Lighten up before we send people off on their way. And it's not that I, I mean, I might be scared of things, but I, I like to write tension. So I have tense, like tense moments in my books. And my favorite setting that I created was uh, a place called the Musungu. Um, and this is in my Vivitira series. And I think this comes up in the second book. But there's a lot of ghosts in the second book. Just, <laughs> I, it was a very, it's a very spooky one. But this, it was a swamp and... In this swamp, it's filled with all these angry ghosts that are stuck roaming this world. They would uh, hide out in the fog, and when but you when they appeared to you, you couldn't look them in the in the like straight on in their face because then they would get really angry. And I think the whole remember in Indiana, it was uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark when they were actually revealing the Ark, and it had those little ghost oh, people yeah where you see the faces of this beautiful ghost and then all of a sudden she turns turn really ugly. ugly and they scary. do the same thing in ghostbusters the original ghostbusters yeah, yeah. like oh she's pretty oh she's not ah, she's not so that's exactly what happened in the in the masungu and so you just couldn't you couldn't make them angry that was really fun to write that really sounds really fun i loved that so, how about you? I really don't have any truly spooky settings, but I'm really, really proud of my inverse world because it was very unpredictable for the main characters, uh, and it was it was created to throw them off balance. And so, the rules of this world is that it was repeating the same day over and over again. If you fell asleep, you would start where in the point you entered the world. Oh my goodness! Um, and so, and you would forget that you were stuck in this loop if you were there long enough. And so um, they were constantly trying to figure out how, how to kind of get out of this world. And they were stuck there. And then the other um, part of it is that the colors were inverted. And so okay. the daytime sky was black and, um, and the sun was blacker. Uh, and the, the so, nighttime so sky. So kind of like the, uh, a negative of a yeah, photograph. Yeah, it was a negative. Okay. And so like the grass is purple and like everything about it was just very foreign. And so they had people who were stuck in there that looked like negative images. Um, and they, it, it was creepy because it was different and they didn't know anything about it. But I also did like a short story about trans dimensional zombies in a graveyard. Um. Yeah, sure. It it was actually just kind of this funny little story, and the it was the main character was a trans dimensional zombie researcher just trying to get reader <laughs> readings, and so they're sitting in the graveyard just trying to get readings as the zombies were going home <laughs> just through a portal <laughs> in the ground. It's weird, weird story. Super great. Very fun. You'll find that. All right, your finishing thoughts. Oh man. Okay, whether it's a creepy amusement park or an isolated cabin, we hope you helped you think about how to make creepy settings in a new way. All you need are a few subtle tweaks and expectations, add in some juicy sensory details, lean on experience and atmosphere, and make your character feel isolated, and voila! You've got a <laughs> recipe for something super creepy! Yes. We do have a listener assignment. All right. Consider the most frightening setting that you've personally experienced in a book or on the screen or in real life and just list the elements that were used to make it scary and see if you can uncover things that you might be able to use in a future project. That's awesome. I think that was a good one. Can you tell us what our next episode's about? Oh, goodness. Oh, this dear. is fun if you're, <laughs> you're so excited. I well, welcome to November. Uh, we'll be in November for this one. And... In the U.S., we've got some pretty exciting things happening in politics. So we're not going to talk about that, but we are going to talk about the politics of fantasy fiction. So there you go. It's going to be fascinating. We'll see how it goes. I have no idea. All right. A huge thanks for listening today. Uh, if you liked anything you've heard, 
Uh, remember, we have a Patreon, a Buy Us a Coffee, and if you haven't already, this is a wonderful opportunity to like and subscribe on your platform of choice. Yay! This has been creepy. I mean, fun. <laughs> oh my gosh. Happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. Thank you for listening to the Squirrel Podcast for the Distracted Writer with Candace J. Thomas and Jody L. Milner. Please like and subscribe to our podcast for updates and new episodes. And find more information at our website, squirrelpodcast.com. Stay distracted, everyone. And so today we'll discuss the craft of the, the craft of crafting. <laughs>